Hi everyone, so we're at chapter 64 of Children of Blood and Bone. We're in Enan's perspective. The walls of the cellar close in. I'm trapped in this hell. It takes everything in me to stand, not to buckle under father's glare. But while I can barely breathe, Zelly rises, defiant and fiery as ever. No regard for her life, no fear for her death. Stop. I want to scream over her. Don't talk. With each word, father's desire to break her grows. He pounds against the door. With two sharp knocks, the metal door flies open. The fortress physician walks in, flanked by three lieutenants. All fix their gaze on the floor. What's going on? My voice comes out hoarse. It's hard to speak through the strain of suppressing my magic once more. Sweat pours down my skin as another blast of heated air funnels through the vent. The physician glances at me. Does your highness... You're under my orders, father interrupts, not his. The physician scurries forward, drawing a sharp knife from his pocket. As I stifle a cry as he slices into Zelly's neck. What are you doing? I yell. Zelly grits her teeth as the physician digs with his blade. Stop! I shout in panic. Not now, not here. I start forward, but Father presses his hand into my shoulder so hard I nearly stumble. I watch in horror as the physician cuts a shallow X into Zelly's neck. With an unsteady hand, he pushes a thick, hollowed out needle into the exposed vein. Zelly tries to jerk her head back, but a lieutenant holds it still. The physician removes a small vial of black liquid and prepares to pour the serum down the needle. Father, is this wise? I turn to him. She knows things. There are more artifacts. She can find them. She's the only person who understands the scroll. Enough. Father's grip on my shoulder tightens until it aches. I'm angry at him now. If I keep going, he'll only cause Zelly more pain. The physician looks back at me, as if looking for a reason to stop. But when Father pounds his fist against the wall, the physician pours the serum through an opening in the hollow needle, feeding it straight into her vein. Zelly's body jerks and spasms. The serum releases under her skin. Her breaths go short and rapid. Her pupils go large and dilated. My own chest tightens as blood pounds inside my head. It's only an echo of what they're doing to her. Don't worry, Father speaks, mistaking my grief for disappointment. One way or another, she'll tell us what she knows. Zelly's muscles seize, rattling the chains. I press against the wall as my own thighs shake. I struggle to keep my voice even. Keeping calm is my only chance of saving her. What did you give her? Something to keep our little maggot awake, Father smiles. Can't have her passing out before we get what we need. A lieutenant slides a dagger from under his belt. Another rips Zelly's dress, exposing, exposing the smooth skin of her back. The soldier holds the blade in the heat of the torch flames. The metal warms, smoldering red. Father steps forward. Zelly's spasms intensify, so violent the other two lieutenants have to hold her down. I admire your defiance, child. It's impressive you've made it this far. But I wouldn't be doing my job as king if I didn't remind you what you are. The knife sears into her skin with a fury so intense her agony leaks into me. A blood-curdling scream rips from Zelly's throat, rips straight from my being. No! I cry out and run forward, plunging straight for the lieutenant. I knock one of the guards holding Zelly back. I kick the other in the gut. My fist collides with the lieutenant carving into her back, but before I can do more, father shouts, restrain him. Instantly, two guards latch onto my arms. The entire world blazes in white. The scent of burning flesh fills my nose. I knew you wouldn't have the stomach for this. Somehow, father's disappointment cuts through the sound of Zelly's shrieks. Remove him. He snaps. Now. I feel Father's command more than I hear it. Though I struggle forward, I'm pushed back. 
All the while, Zelly's screams grow. She only gets farther and farther away. Her sobs and screams bounce against the metal walls. As her singed flesh cools, I make out the shape of an M. And when Zelly's breathing grows shallow, the lieutenant starts on the A. No! They throw me into the hallway, the door slams shut. I pound so hard my knuckles split and bleed, but no one comes out. Think! I ram my head against the door, blood pounding as her screams grow. I can't get in. I need to get her out. I race along the corridor, but the distance does nothing to break the anguish. Concerned flash f faces flash as I stumble past. Lips move, people speak. I can't make out their sounds over Zelly's screams. Her shrieks ring through the door. They screech even louder in my head. I crash into the nearest washroom and slam the door. Somehow I latch the lock. I can sense they've started on the G now. It's as if the curve is etched into my own back. Ugh. I grasp the porcelain sink's rim with shaking hands. Everything in me comes out. My throat stings from the burn of vomit. The world spins around me, violent and thrashing. It's all I can do not to pass out. I have to power through, though. I need to get Zelly out. I wheeze. Cool air hits me like a brick to the face. It pulls the scent of wet grass into my lungs. Wilted reeds tickle my feet. The dreamscape. The realization brings me to my knees. But I have no time to waste. I have to save her. I need her. I need to bring her to this place. I close my eyes and picture her face. The haunting silver of her eyes. What new letter have they carved into her back? Her heart? Her soul? Within seconds, Zelly appears, gasping half naked. Her hands grip the earth. Her eyes hang empty in her head. She stares at her shaking fingers with no recognition of where she is, who she is. Zelly, something's missing. It takes me a second to realize what's wrong. Her spirit doesn't surge like the ocean tides. The sea salt scent of her soul is gone. Zell, the world seems to shrink around us, pulling in the blurred white borders. She's still. So still I don't know if she's heard me or not. I reach out. When my fingers graze her skin, she shrieks and scrambles back. Zell. Her eyes flash something feral. Her trembling intensifies. When I move toward her, she crawls back, shattered, broken. I stop and put my hands up. My chest aches at the sight. There's no sign of the warrior I know. The fighter who spit in father's face. I don't see Zell at all. Only the shell father left behind. You're safe, I whisper. No one can hurt you here. But her eyes fill with tears. I can't feel it, she cries. I can't feel anything. Feel what? I move toward her, but she shakes her head and pushes herself back through the reeds with her feet. It's gone, she says the same words again gone. She curls into the reeds, writhing with the pain she can't escape. Duty before self. I dig my fingers into the dirt. Father's voice rings loud in my head. Duty above all else. Kwame's flames come back to life behind my eyes, blazing through everything in their path. My duty is to prevent that. My duty has to be keeping Arisha alive, but the creed rings hollow carving a hole inside me like the knife that carved through Zelly's back. Duty isn't enough when it means destroying the girl I love. We just finished chapter 64. So a very intense chapter, both emotionally and physically, for our two characters, Mari and Enan, here. So what has happened to, um, not Amari, Zelly. What's happened to Zelly mentally and emotionally throughout this torture that she's just gone to overgone? What has she lost um, that we now see in the dreamscape that she no longer has here. And how do we think Enan is going to try and get her to escape now? So chapter 65 is from Amari's perspective. I keep it going. This will work. By the skies, this has to work. I hold on to this flickering hope as Tizane and I slip down the alleys between the rusted structures of Gombe, blending into the shadows and darkness. A city of iron and foundry, Gombe's factories run late into the night. 
erected by welders before the raid, metal structures rise and bend in impossible shapes. Unlike the tiers dividing the classes of Lagos, Gombe is split into four quadrants, partitioning residential life from its iron exports to the dust-covered window diviner workers forging Arishan goods for the next day. Wait. Tizane holds me back as a patrol of armored guards clunk by. Okay, he whispers when they pass, but his voice lacks its usual determination. This will work, I repeat in my head, wishing I could convince Tizane as well. When this is over, Zelly will be all right. With time, the streets of cluttered, cramped mills transform into the towering iron domes of the downtown district. As bells ring, released workers swarm us each covered in dust and ferrous metal burns. We follow the swell toward the music and drums pumping into the night. As the aroma of liquor replaces the stench of smoke, a cluster of bars appears, each nestled under a small rusted dome. Will he be here? I ask as we walk up to a particularly shoddy structure that hums quieter than the rest. It's the best place to look. When I was in Gombe last year for the Arishan Games, Kenyon and his team took me here every night. Good. I muster a smile for Tizane's sake. It's all we need. Don't be so sure. Even if we find him, I doubt he'll want to help. He's a diviner. He won't have a choice. Diviners rarely have choices. Tizane wraps his knuckles against the metal door. When they do, they usually choose to look after themselves. Before I can respond, a slit in the door slides open. A gruff voice barks out, Password. Loish. That's old. Oh. Jazane pauses as if the right word might appear out of thin air. That's the only one I know. The man shrugs. Password changes every quarter moon. I push to Zane aside and climb onto my tiptoes, straining to reach the slit. We do not live in Gombe, sir. Please help us. The man narrows his eyes and spits through the slit. I recoil in disgust. No one gets in without a password, he seethes, especially not some noble. Sir, please, Tizane moves me aside. If Kenyon's in there, can you let him know I'm here? Tizane Adabola from Aloran. The slit slams shut. I stare at the metal door in dismay. If we don't get inside, Sally's as good as gone. Is there another way in? I ask. No, Tizane groans. This was never going to work. We're wasting time. While we stand here, Zell's probably dead. His voice catches. He closes his eyes, stealing everything inside. I unfold his clenched fists and reach for his face, placing my hands on his cheeks. Tizane, trust me. I will not let you down. If Kenyon isn't here, we can find someone else. God! The doors swing open and a large diviner appears, dark arms covered in sleeves of ornate tattoos. I guess I owe Connie a gold piece. His white hair clumps in long, tight locks, all piled atop a bun on his head. He wraps his arms around Tizane, somehow eclipsing his massive frame. Man, what are you doing here? I'm not supposed to beat your team for two weeks. Tizane forces a laugh. It's your team I'm worried about. Heard you twisted your knee. Kenyon pulls up the leg of his pants, revealing a metal brace anchored around his thigh. Doctor says it'll heal before qualifiers, but I'm not worried. I could take you in my sleep. His eyes move to me, slow and indulging. Please tell me a pretty little thing like this didn't... Like you didn't come here just to see Tizane lose. Tizane shoves Kenyon and he laughs, sliding his arm around Tizane's neck. It amazes me that Kenyon can't sense the desperation that Tizane holds back. He's good, D. Kenyon turns to the bar's guard. Promise I can vouch for him. The owner of the gruff voice peeks around the door. Though he appears to be only in his 20s, his face is marked with scars. Even the girl. He nods at me. Tizane slides his hand over mine. She's fine. Tizane vouches for me. Won't say a word. D hesitates but steps back, allowing Kenyon to lead us inside, though he makes sure to glare at me until I disappear from his sight. The thud of drums reverberates through my skin as we enter the ill-lit bar. The dome is packed, and the patrons are young, 
No one looks much older than Kenyon or Tizane. Everyone shrinks in and out of shadows, shrouded by weak, flickering candlelight. Its glow illuminates the chipping paint and patches of rust marring the walls. In the back corner, two men pound a soft beat on the canvas of their Ashiko drums, while another hits the wooden keys of a balafon. They play with a practiced ease, filling the iron walls with their lively sound. What is this place? I whisper into Zane's ear. Though I've never stepped foot in a bar, I soon realize why this one requires a password. Among all the patrons, almost everyone's hair shines white, creating a sea overflowing with diviners. The few Kasaidan who made it inside are visibly linked to the diviners who belong. The various couples sit hand in hand, sharing kisses, closing the space between their hips. It's called a toju, to Zane responds. Diviners started them a few years ago. They have them in most cities. It's one of the only places diviners can go to gather in peace. Suddenly, the doorman's animosity doesn't feel as misplaced. I can only imagine how quickly the guards could dispatch a gathering like this. I've played against these guys for years, Zane whispers as Kenyon leads us toward a table in the back. They're loyal, but they're guarded. Let me do the talking. I'll ease them in. We don't have time for easing, I whisper back. If we don't get them to fight, there won't be a fight if I can't convince them to say yes. Tizane gives me a gentle nudge. I know we're tight on time, but with them, we need to take it slow. Tizane! A chorus of excitement erupts when we reach a table with the four diviners, I can only assume, complete Kenyon's Agbon team. Each player is bigger than the last. Even the twin girls, Tizane calls Imani and Connie, almost match his height. Tizane's presence incites smiles and laughter. Everyone rises, slapping his hand, patting his back, teasing Tizane about the coming Agbon tournament. Tizane's instructions to take it slow buzz in my head, but his friends are so consumed with games, they do not even realize Tizane's world is falling apart. We need your help. I break through the noise. The first sentence I manage to get in, the team pauses to stare at me as if noticing me for the first time. Kenyon sips on his bright orange drink and turns to Tizane. Talk, what do you need? They sit in silence as Tizane explains our precarious situation. Hushed when they hear about the fall of the Diviner settlement, he tells them everything from the origin of the scroll to the impending ritual, ending with Zelly's capture. The solstice is in two days, I add. If we're going to make it, we need to act fast. Damn, if I sighs, his shaved head reflecting the candlelight. I'm sorry, but if she's in there, there's no getting her out. There has to be something we can do, Zane points to Femi, a broad diviner with a cropped beard. Can't your father help? Isn't he still bribing the guards? Femi's face darkens. Without a word, he jerks back, rising so fast he almost knocks over the table. They took his father a few moons ago, Connie drops her voice. It started as a tax mix-up, but three days later they found his body, Imani finishes. Guys, I stare after Femi as he makes his way through the crowd. Another victim of father's power. One more reason we must act now. Tizane's face falls. He reaches out and grips someone's metal cup so hard it dents under his touch. It's not over, I speak up. If we can't bribe our way in, we can break her out. Kenyon snorts and takes another long swig of his drink. We're big, not dumb. How is this dumb? I ask. You don't need your size, you just need your magic. At magic, the whole table freezes. It's as if I've hissed a, hurt, hissed a hurtful slur. Everyone turns to look at one another, but Kenyon fixes a sharp glare at me. We don't have magic. Not yet. I pull out the scroll from my pack. But we can give you your powers back. The fortress was designed to hold, to hold back men not magi. I expect at least one of them to take a closer look, but everyone stares at the scroll as if it's a fuse about to blow. Kenyon backs up from the table. It's time for you to go. In an instant, Amani and Connie rise, each gripping one of my arms. Hey! Tizane yells. 
He struggles as if Ife and Kenyon hold him back. Let go! The bar stops, not wanting to miss out on the entertainment. Though I kick and shout, the girls do not relent. Instead of rushing to the doors as if their lives depend on it. But as Imani's breath comes out in short rasps and Connie's grip on me tightens, the realization sinks in. They're not angry. They're afraid. I twist out of their grasp the maneuver Enan taught me moons ago. I grab the hilt of my sword, releasing the blade with a sharp flick. I am not here to hurt you. I keep my voice low. My only desire is to bring your magic back. Who the hell are you? Amani asks. Tizane finally breaks free of Kenyon's and Ife's grip. He pushes through Diviners and the twins to get to my side. She's with me. He forces Imani to back up. That's all you need to know. It's all right. I step out of Tizane's shadow, leaving the circle of his protection. Every eye in the bar pierces through me, but for once I do not shrink away. I picture mother before a crowd of oleas, able to command a room with just the slightest arch of her brow. I must call on that power now. I am Princess Amari, daughter of King Saren, and though the words have never left my lips, I now realize there is no other choice. I cannot let the line of succession stand in my way. And I am the future queen of Orisha. Tizane's brows knit in surprise, but he doesn't let himself rest in his shock for too long. The bar erupts in an unyielding chatter that takes forever to quiet down. Eventually, he manages to silence the crowd. Eleven years ago, my father took your magic away. If we don't act now, we'll lose the only chance we will ever have to bring it back. I look around the toju, waiting for someone to challenge me or try to throw me out again. A few of the diviners leave, but most stay hungry for more. I unclench the scroll and hold it up so they can see its ancient script. A diviner leans in to touch it and yelps when a burst of air shoots from his hand. The accidental display gives me all the proof I need. There's a sacred ritual, one that will restore your connection to the gods. If my friends and I don't complete it during the centennial solstice in two days, magic will disappear forever. If my father will run through the streets slaughtering your people again. He will stab you in the heart. He'll kill you like he killed my friend. I look around the room, locking eyes with each diviner. There's more than your magic at risk. Your very survival is on the line. The mutters continue until someone from the crowd shouts, What do we have to do? I step forward, resheathing my blade and lifting my chin. There's a girl trapped in the guard's fortress outside Gombe. She is the key. I need your magic to get her out. If you save her, you save yourselves. The room remains silent for a long moment. Everyone stands still, but Kenyon leans back, crossing his arms with a, an expression I can't discern. Even if we wanted to help, whatever magic that scroll gave us wouldn't be strong enough. Do not worry. I reach into Zelly's leather pack and pull out the sunstone. If you agree to help, I will take care of that. So we just finished chapter 65. So Amari is really taking control. So she's also made this sort of promise to herself that she's going to be the new queen. So how do you think that's going to work? Because Enan wants to rule and take over for his father, but in a little different capacity because he still wants magic gone. But Amari still wants full magic. So how's that going to work? So we also have a potential plan now to get Zelly out. So chapter 66 is an Enan's perspective. Zelly's screams haunt me long after the end. Shrill, piercing, Though her broken consciousness rests in the dreamscape, my physical connection to her body remains. Echoes of her anguish burn my skin. At times, the ache is so severe it hurts to draw breath. I fight to mask the pain as I knock on Father's door. Magic or not, I have to save her. I've already failed Zelly once. I'll never forgive myself if I allow her to perish here. Enter. I open the door and push my magic down, stepping into the commander's quarters that fathers commandeered. He stands in his velvet night robes, scanning a faded map. No sign of hatred, not even of disgust. For him, carving maggot into a girl's back is just another day's work. 
You wanted to see me? Father chooses not to answer for a long moment. He picks up the map and holds it to the light. A red X marks the Diviner's Valley. In that instant, it hits me. Zoo's death, Zelly's screams, they don't mean a thing to him. Because they're magi, they're nothing. He preaches duty before self, but his Orisha doesn't include them. It never has. He doesn't just want to erase magic, he wants to erase them. You disgraced me, he finally speaks. That's no way to conduct yourself during an interrogation. I wouldn't call that an interrogation. Father sets the map down. Excuse me? Nothing. That's what he expects me to say, but... Zelly sobs and shakes in the corners of my mind. I wouldn't call torture by another name. I didn't learn anything of use, Father, did you? My voice crescendos. The only information I received was how loud you can make a girl scream. To my surprise, Father smiles, but his smile is more dangerous than his fury. Your travels have fortified you, he nods. Good, but do not waste your energy defending that maggot. I know long before the slur leaves Father's lips, it's how he sees them all. How he would see me. I shift, moving until I can check my reflection in the mirror. Once again, the streak is covered under a coat of black dye, but skies only know how long that'll last. We are not the first to bear this burden. To go these links to keep our kingdom safe? The Bretonians, the Portoleganes, all crushed because they didn't fight magic hard enough. You would have me spare the maggot and allow Arisha to suffer the same fate? That is not what I proposed, but a maggot like that is a, like a wild rider, Father continues. It won't just give you answers. You have to break its will, demonstrate a new command. He turns his gaze back to the parchment. He marks another X over a Lauren. You'd understand that if you had the disposition to stay. By the end, the maggot told me everything I needed to know. A bead of sweat runs down my back. I clench my fists. Everything. Father nods. The scroll can only be destroyed with magic. I suspected this much after Admiral Abele's failure, but the girl confirmed it. With her in our grasp, we finally have everything we need. Once we retrieve the scroll, we'll have her do the deed. My heartbeat pulses into my throat. I have to close my eyes to keep calm. So she'll live. For now. Father runs his finger over the X, marking the Diviner Valley. The red ink runs thick, dripping like blood. Perhaps it's for the best, he sighs. She killed Kia. A quick death would be a gift. My body goes rigid. I blink hard too hard. What? I stammer. She said that? I struggle to say more, but every word dries in my throat. Kia's hatred flashes back into my eyes. Maggot. She confessed to being at the temple. Father speaks of the, as if the answer was obvious. That's where they recovered Kia's body. He picks up a small turquoise crystal stained with blood. My stomach twists as he holds it up to the light. What's that? I ask, though I already know the answer. Some kind of residue. Father's lip curls. The maggot left these in Kia's hair. Father crushes the remnants of my magic till it crumbles into dust. As it breaks, the smell of iron and wine hits me. The scent of Kia's soul. When you find your sister, end her. Father speaks more to himself than to me. There's no shortage of people I would eradicate to keep you both safe, but I cannot forgive her for whatever role she played in Kia's demise. I grip the hilt of the sword I grip the I grip the hilt of the sword and force a nod. I can almost feel the knife carving traitor into my back. I'm sorry, I know she was your son. I know how much she meant to you. Father twists his ring, lost in his emotions. She didn't want to go. She feared something like this would happen. I think she feared disappointing you more than her own death. We all do. We all ha always have. No one more than me. What will you do with her? I ask. With who? Zelly. 
Father blinks at me. He's forgotten she has a name. The physician is tending to her now. We believe her brother has the scroll. Tomorrow we'll use her as leverage to retrieve it. After it's in our hands, she'll destroy it for good. And after that, I press. After it's gone, what then? She dies. Father turns back to his map, charting a course. We'll parade her corpse around Arisha, remind everyone what happens if they defy us. If there's even a whiff of rebellion, we'll wipe them all out, then and there. What if there's another way? I speak up. I glance at the cities on the map. What if we could hear their complaints, use the girl as an ambassador? There are people, people she loves. We could use them to keep her in line. A magi we control. Each word feels like a betrayal, but when father doesn't interrupt, I keep going. I don't have a choice. I have to save her at all costs. I've seen these things on, I've seen things on these travels, father. I understand the diviners now. If we can improve their situation, we'll quell the possibility of rebellions altogether. My father thought the same thing. I suck in a quick breath. Father never speaks of his family. The little I know about them comes from gossip and whispers around the palace. He thought we could end their oppression, build a better kingdom. I thought so too, but then they killed him. Him and every other person I loved. Father places a cold hand on my neck. Believe me when I say there's no other way. You saw what that burner did to their camp. I nod, although I wish I hadn't. There's no fighting father now that I've seen humans incinerated so fast they couldn't even scream. Father's grip tightens, almost to the point of pain. Heed my word and learn this lesson now, before it's too late. Father steps forward and embraces me. I touch so foreign my body flinches in shock. The last times that his arms were wrapped around me was when I was young, after I cut Amari. A man who can cut his own sister is a man who can be a great king. For a second, I allowed myself to feel proud. I was happy as my sister bled. I didn't believe in you, he pulls back. I didn't think you would succeed, but you've kept Arisha safe. All of this will make you a great king. Unable to speak, I nod. Father turns back to his maps. He's done with me now. With nothing more to say, I leave the room. Feel, I command myself. Feel something. Father's giving me everything I've ever wanted. After all this time, he finally believes I'll be a great king. But when the door slams shut, my legs buckle. I slide to the ground. With Zelly locked in chains, it doesn't mean a thing. Okay, so we just finished chapter 436, so pause in the video and do your summary and note for that chapter. We're going to quickly move on to chapter 67, continuing in Eden's perspective. I wait till father slumbers, until the guards leave their post. I sit in the shadows, watching the iron door, moans when the physician exits her cell. His face is blanched with strain, his clothes stained with her blood. The sight of him fortifies my desires. Find her, save her. I zip across the floor and slide in my key. As the door groans open, I brace myself for the sight. Nothing can prepare me. Zelly hangs limp, her body nearly lifeless, her torn dress soaked through with blood. The sight rips a new hole inside me. And Father thinks the Magi's are the animals? Shame and rage thrash within me as I select the right key. This isn't about magic. For once, it has to be about her. I unlock the shackles binding her wrists and ankles, freeing Zelly from their hold. I catch her in my arms and cover her mouth. As she wakes, I muffle the sounds of her screams. Her pain ripples through me. Already the physician's stitches are splitting. Her blood seeps out. I can't feel it, she whimpers against my skin. I adjust my arms to put pressure on the bandages around her back. You will. I try to soothe her. What in Sky's name does she mean? Her mind is a wall, running her torture on a constant loop. There's no ocean, no spirit, no scent of the sea. I can't see beyond the anguish. She lives in this prison of her pain. Don't do this. Her nails claw into my shoulder as we ascend an empty stairwell. I'm already bleeding out. Just leave me. The heat of her blood leaks through my fingers. 
I press harder against her back. We'll find a healer. Guards' boots clank around the corner. I duck into an empty room as I wait for them to pass by. She cringes and fights back a scream. I press her even tighter to my chest. When the corridor clears, I ascend another set of stairs. My heart pounds with every step. They'll kill you, she whispers as I run. He'll kill you. I steel myself against her words. I can't think about that now. All that matters is this. I need to get Zelly out. The shout rings first. The heat comes next. We crash to the ground as a blast from above shatters through the fortress wall. We just finished chapter 67 on a cliffhanger. So take your moment and do your summary of all the chapters. Make sure you're answering all the questions. And with one of your questions on this um, close reading journals is asking what has Enan finally gotten that he's won all of his entire life and what happens now that he's gotten that. So really think to the end of chapter uh, 66, what does he says? What does it say that he's finally gotten from his father? But does he really want it anymore? Okay. So make sure you do your close reading journals. Have a wonderful day.